right. Hi guys, it's Amy Gorelick again. Um, we're time for this week's so, uh, as a female player coach and uh, Todd's here with me. And uh, I want to introduce to you one of my favorite people ever, um, Amy Griffin, that's you. And uh, I had the amazing opportunity to play for Amy um, in college at the University of New Mexico. And uh, my senior year, Amy moved on and uh, went to coach at the University of Washington. She was there for 23 years. Um, and we get to have a, an awesome conversation tonight with Amy. Um, just a little bit about Amy Griffin's background. Um, as a player, she was Amy Allman. Uh, we ended up growing up in the same town together. Um, she's a little older than me, though. Um, <laughs> and uh, so uh, she grew up playing at a different high school than I went to. Um, went and played at the University of Central Florida. And Amy, what years did you play there? Uh, did, was, I was on a team for, from 84 to 87. I played 86, 87. So. All right. All right. Um, Amy was uh, one of the first goalkeepers on the U.S. women's national team, had the opportunity after college to win uh, the first World Cup on the women's side in 1991. So we'll talk a little bit about that experience. And then um, after playing, uh, there wasn't a lot of pathways for, there were no pathways really for um, the women back in the early 90s. And so she got into coaching and is now like coaching extraordinaire. And uh, Lisa Frazier's on here with her. And uh, I think Lisa and Amy were one of the first women um, in the United States to have their A license. So um, pretty cool, pretty uh, amazing group um, of female coaches that we have um, at least on tonight. Um, Amy, did I miss anything? Nope. Don't be humble. No, I mean, I'm the same person, no matter what hat I'm wearing. I think, I don't know. I, I, uh, I coached the deaf women's national team. There we go. There and we then go. probably one of the, the neatest experiences that I didn't realize until recently was eight years ago, I coached a, I helped coach a youth national team on a, on a, in a very limited role. I was the goalkeeper coach, but I got to travel with the U 20 national team eight years ago. Okay. And eight years ago, I got to become close friends, just like you do when you're traveling and eating chicken a million different ways in the hotels. And, um, you know, we go to countries that really aren't great and things are never perfect. That's how you get closer. <clears throat> and so when we went to France, uh, the people that I spent time with that said, Hey, why don't you come, come spend the night in the hotel with us and bring your kids and let's watch the semifinal game. Um, where I don't know if you recognize these names, but it was Sam Mewis. Lindsay Horan, Rose Lavelle, Crystal Dunn, uh, Alyssa, um, Julie Johnson, Julie Ertz, and it was it was funny because I was with my kids and they've been at all the all the women's World Cups and they were like I want their autograph. I said I'm not going to ask for their autograph. I go they're so busy and we didn't know what hotel they were in. We had no idea what hotel we were in. And Nick is reading the newspaper. He says I think I know where they might be. And so I go okay, we'll go to a restaurant and we'll go see if. Um, if we bump into any of their families, just to say hi, I'll recognize their parents. And so we were walking in and it was Sam Mew. So it was like, Nick, Amy, like, why don't you come join us? So we got to spend the evening with them. And I, it was the only time my teenage boys thought I, I played the cool card, that I was the cool, the cool mom, the only time. But it was, a really good, it was a really good lesson. And you just gotta be your best self the whole time because as limited a role as I played, um, I think it was big in their lives. And so I played my cards right because they couldn't wait to see us. So it was, it was good. Like little did I know eight years later, they'd be asking me to sit and watch a game with them a day before their final. So it was pretty cool. That's yeah. awesome. Yeah. So um, thank you everyone that's joined. Um, this again is Amy Griffin. Um, we'll be talking with her tonight. Um, if you have any questions, um, Javi, how do you want them to um, ask the questions? We want to do that at the end, personalized. Yeah, absolutely. So let's go ahead and wait till the end. Uh, put your questions in the chat. Walter will call out your name and ask you to uh, to ask your question to Amy, and then that way you can talk to her and have a conversation. Perfect. All right. So Amy, um, you're one of the very few that has um, a Women's World Cup ring that you show off every once in a while. Um, I was just looking around my room to see if I knew if I knew where it was. <laughs> That's right. Uh, so tell us about the uh, the 91 World Cup. I mean, you're, it, it's a very different experience than it is now. 
um, or it was then. Um, so tell us about the 91 playing for Anson Endurance, playing with uh, Michelle Akers, Mia Hamm, um, all of that crew. Yeah. Um, so I got on, on eight, in 80, 86, 87, and they added a, not, a lot of young players. I, was, I wasn't one of the young players. They just happened to add me. So I, a lot of young players. It was Joy, Joy Fawcett, Mia Hamm, Christine Lilly, Julie Foudy. And they didn't even have their driver's licenses yet. And I was out of college. So that was a little bit of the age disparity there. And um, during that time, there was only two training camps a year. And then we'd play in an event. So we really understood the value of training on your own. And what you, if you wanted to be your best and get called back, if you showed up and, and everyone else had closed this gap and you had just stayed home saying, oh, I'm on the national team, you didn't get invited back. And it was the worst way to do it because there was no email at the time. And, and you literally went to your mailbox and you either got an airplane ticket or you didn't. So then there were those awkward phone calls like, hey, Lauren Henry, did you, did you get your ticket? She's like, no, I didn't get it. I go, oh, me neither, me neither, even though I would have mine. So that's how you would find out if you made the travel team or not. And um, just knowing that our, the people's mindset, I think, that got to stay on the team is a lot, you know, Joy Fawcett, 17 years. That's amazing at, at a sport that's so difficult. Um, they were the ones that felt like everyone else, when they were sitting down, was, must be doing something. And so I really learned I really learned how to train on my own. And it was the best gift that's been given me because you, you do drive your own atmosphere. You do drive your own environment, wherever you are, in work or school or whatever. You can't sit around and wait for someone to create it for you because it's not going to be as good as you want it to be. So two camps a year. Um, we got fitness tests, there were fitness tests, and then um, the goalkeeper coach was different every single time, and I was the shortest one, so I felt like I was the underdog, which was perfect for me because there's no pressure for the underdog. And we go to a tournament, so in 87, it was supposed to be the first Women's World Cup, and then they decided that they didn't think the women deserved it. So right at the last minute, they said, we're not having it, um, but all the teams still met, and and got together anyway. And we lost, believe it or not, the women lost all the time. So we lost to Brazil 3-0. We lost to Italy. We lost to Germany. Um, and then all of a sudden there was this one tournament in Blaine, Minnesota. Uh, and we beat China 1-0. And we tied Sweden 1-1. And we beat Germany. And it was it was maybe eight months before the World Cup, and I will never forget looking around the locker room. And I was a starter at that time, looking around the locker room, and everyone just, not with words, but just with eye content saying, maybe we can do this. Maybe we can win. So that's, that was the nail on the coffin for the competitive edge, and, and nobody ever looked back. Um, and then, then it was the tough part of, of picking a final roster because the pool was 24 and only 18 went. So all of us kids have been together for a long, long time. Um, how many of you guys, you can just raise your hand. I can see a lot of you on here. How many of you guys are, get quite, kind of um, nervous when the new kid joins a team? Any of you guys just are like, oh, who is that? Or do you, have your, do you have your clicks? Like everyone's got their clicks, don't lie. You all have your people that you gravitate toward, right? You may, yeah, right, right. You may, have, you may be a great teammate, but you're just, you can't be best friends with everyone. So you kind of have your... You kind of have your go-tos, right? Kind of, you do kind of? Okay. Well, so that, that was us. Is we had the West Coast people and all the people that went to Carolina and the East Coast people. And honestly, that was when that changed too, is when we said, you know what, we can win something. We also had 26-year-olds and 14-year-olds. And so try to be a 26-year-old rooming with somebody that is 14 and homesick and bawling their eyes out. And we just had to find a way to be great teammates. Okay, so... That was another lesson that I learned. And I learned it the hard way because I got on the plane as the starting goalkeeper of the World Cup. I had just played the last 12 games all the way up through qualifying. And Anson, the head coach, knew that there was a goalkeeper playing in the Bundesliga named Mary Harvey who had way more games than I did. So how many camps did we say we went to a year? Two. Two. Right. You guys are great listeners. Two camps. So we didn't even play any games in those camps. We just trained. So how many games had I played in in a year? 
zero, the big goose egg. So Anson decided that he should find a goalkeeper that maybe wasn't so short, right? And that had a lot of games. So I got off the plane and I knew who she was. She played in our region. She went to Cal Berkeley and I got off the plane as a second string goalkeeper. So I was the only player in on the U.S. national team roster that didn't play one second. Um, and I could and I could see how everyone was hurting for me, especially my click. Right. My click was just couldn't even look at me that didn't and so I had to put on a good face I had to fake it a little bit and go you guys I'm fine because if they worry about me they can't focus on winning world cup right so I just fake, faked it and I was hurting I, my mom and dad flew to China they were hurting for me and then I just had to put on a good face and go Mary who was a starting keeper what do you need from me like I want to win this thing what do you need from me and eventually you could tell that everyone sort of eased the tension had sort of eased okay, well, thank you, love you. and um everyone was kind of just kind of back in the flow and they thought I was okay. And then I became okay. Right. I was like, I want to, I'll do whatever it takes. I'll do whatever it takes. So we end up winning a world cup. And, um, one of the ki one of the players on the team didn't get to play as much as she would have liked. And she kind of had a sour face. And I remember walking up to her and saying, you're going to take the fun away from my old gold medal because I feel like I deserve it as much as anybody else. Like I am so, and I, and I honestly feel like that, that if everyone has a value to what they bring to the team and I feel like, honestly, I don't think I was ever the best. I don't think I was ever the best goalkeeper anyway. I think I was such a good team player that they needed to find a roster spot for me somehow. So um, we won a world cup and then we went home and there was, uh, one parent at the airport in New York City and one reporter and that team has never been together again like we all thought we'd get a ticker tape parade wow. and we never really we never really realized um, we never realized what that moment signified and now when I, I've been on the podium for two other gold medals not as, as a coach for the deaf women's national team and for the u20s and now I'm I'm actually, it's sad for me. It's fun to win it. I wouldn't want to be second, but it, to me, it's, it reminds me more of the end of something. Like I still want to be a better coach and I still hope the players want to be better. You reached your goal, right? Dunzo. Isn't that a weird thing? Like you, you, everything you've been dreaming for, you get, and you get to celebrate for a moment and then it's never that way again. And you have to find something else to drive you. And the, the real players, I talked to Sam Mewis after the World Cup, and she said, well, I'm still living in my parents' basement. Like, nothing has changed, right? She's, she, I'm still living in my parents' basement, and I'm just now finding out how much fun soccer is. I thought, I thought the gold medal was it, but it's, I cannot wait to find out how much better I can become because the, the, the better I become, the more fun it, beget, it gets. So she's like, I, my, my drive has been after the wrong thing. It's not the medal. And I'll tell you, and I know I'm talking too much about one silly question, but those players that get those medals, the, the Sam Muses of the world and Joy Fawcett, Lisa, you know Joy, you know Fowdy, they don't have gold medals because they're good soccer players. They are such great people. That's why they have the gold medals. Like it takes, you have to, you have to have the desire and the grit and the passion and follow that, follow the right path of, without getting kicked off the path and being afraid to come back in that's it, it's who they are is why is why they have those so yeah done talking that was one question i better be no, 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 no. um i want to I, I want to go back to the point that you made of back in the early days with the national team and um, you guys had to train on your own and all of our kids are in that same boat right now where you're used to having three day three training sessions a week two games on a weekend and here you're shut down and um so your experience 30 years ago what is very much like our kids right now in COVID. Yeah, we, we did have to find ways to get creative. And I remember talking to Debbie Belkin who lived in Michigan. And I remember calling her and saying, uh, well, you know, it's just too cold here. I'm not going to train today. And I live in Seattle and it was probably raining. Right. And she said, well, I shoveled my garage and shoveled my driveway and I just did shuttles because there's too much snow to do anything else. I'm like, oh God, here she is doing shuttles. And I'm like, oh, it's too rainy, I can't go, right? <laughs> so we just kind of kept each other accountable. We had enough people in our lives that 
weren't afraid of the competition, including the other goalkeepers were like, for fitness, us goalkeepers, we'd be like, how are we going to pass 120s? How are we going to pass 120s? I go, okay, I'm going to stand in, in between Karen Jennings and Karen Gabera, or yeah, Karen Gabera and Michelle Akers. I'm going to stand in between those two. I can't stand next to the goalkeeper. I'm like, we're too slow. If I stand next to you, we're both going to fail, right? So I put the, the people that had had my back and they'd be, come on, Amy, you can do this. You can do this. So wherever I put myself and the people I surrounded myself with were people that was, were going to help me succeed, not that wanted to see me fail. So training on the own was a big deal. And I think becoming a pro player, it's really hard for them as well because they're so used to the college. Um, everything is you're told what to do every step of the way. And you have nutrition meetings and you have weight workouts and you have school a ton of school and study sessions and tutoring and then they go pro and they're just soccer players and i know the people that haven't succeeded thought that it was just training and then they go eat bonbons and watch netflix and then they go out to the next training and over the course of the season they would realize that some players were getting a lot better and they weren't and it was what how those guys managed their off time and they would either go work on technical things which is really light load on your body but really work on those things that they ha they had plenty of time for now. And, and I don't know what, what is it like? What are the restrictions for you guys in Tucson? Uh, we're, there's no group training. It's all individual. You could do zoom sessions with your, with your coaches. What do you like? What do you mean? Like a zoom session? Like you would have a coach running a zoom session, but you mean like talking or soccer, 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 really? Or, or talking. Yeah. So that's, that's what, what we've been doing. So you're, when you're doing your session and you're saying it's a soccer session, are you telling them what to do with the ball? There are coaches that are doing that, yeah. And they're not outside? They're not outside. <laughs> well, they could be. I suppose they could be outside. Could be outside. Yeah, the kids could be outside. The players, the players so, you could, so, yeah, there's no – we can't even be outside right now. The parks are – we have to – we can run on the street. <laughs> and that's about it. So, I mean, they've taken basketball hoops off so people don't play basketball. Um, there's tape around everything. You can't get into anything. So we have to be even more creative. But yeah, there's no reason. This is such a big block of time. And you always say you don't have time. Our kids at Rain Academy, they had to pick one or two things that I'm always saying, you know what, five years from now, you're going to say, man, I wish I would have worked on that because my college coach is telling me I need to work on driving a longer ball more accurately. You can do it in this time. You should be better at something in your tool, your toolbox should be, you should have either a new tool that you never had before, a, a left foot that can go 20 yards or more accurately driven with, you know, not much of this going on, or you can head the ball better, or you're not afraid to head the ball, or your defensive posture is better. There's something that if you did it for seven weeks over and over and over the right way, you'd, you'd be better. I know that because I had zero left foot. Back when I played soccer, you, you could be a goalkeeper and pick up a back pass. So I did not have to have feet, right? But now I train goalkeepers for a living, and so I have to have good feet. So I, when I tore my Achilles, it took me about six weeks to learn how to hit a ball with my left foot. Six weeks. I can cross a ball. It's not as accurate as my right, but I don't shy away from it. So, yeah, the training on your own is, is the way – that's the only way you're going to close the gap. If you're at team training – you know, if you're doing what everyone else is doing right now, great. But if you're doing a little bit more and you, you guys are all going to show up on the field here sometime, hopefully really, really soon. And you're going to, you're Amy, you're going to see, you're going to see, wow, someone did something over this time and someone did not. It's going to be so clear. Yeah, absolutely. All right. So talking about players and um, you spent 24 years, actually closer to 30 years as a division one coach. Um, 24 of those at the University of Washington. Um, tell us about um, like training, like players, what you're looking for um, out of a college player or potential um, college player. It, it's a, you texted me that question and I, I put a lot of thought into it because my answer has changed over the years. And it, it doesn't mean that, and it's almost like I have a category right now and it's a symbol I put on a roster. So I put, I use, sometimes I use symbols so that if I accidentally draw, drop my paper, no one will know what I think about that player. Cause I, I would, cause sometimes I don't think highly of players. <laughs> right. And, and it keeps it objective. It, it keeps it. So I don't say, Oh, that was the kid that was, you know, that looks closer to another kid I like or whatever. It's just, it's just a symbol. 
so that if I go back and look at that kid, I'm like, this, this was what her impact was on the game. And I, and I will say, um, one of it, it, the first category, and it goes in four, are you a hard worker? So if you're a hard worker, you get a dot. Are you a harder worker? You get a dot with a circle. Or are you the, I mean, a dot with a dashed circle. Are you the hardest worker? Then you get the dot with a circle. Everything's filled in. So that's the first thing. And, and to, in my mind, that's the most important thing because it just tells me who you are that it doesn't matter what the score is or it doesn't matter if you made a mistake. Because if you made a mistake and cash it in and you throw your hands up at a teammate or you're mad at yourself, meaning that you're more important than that mistake, then you're not the hardest worker. You're not thinking what's next. So that's the first category. And the second category is technical efficiency. So I don't really care if you're super, super fast. If you can move the ball fast, that will always move faster than the fastest person. So technical efficiency. Um, is does the ball give you problems and the ball controlling you? Or are you controlling the ball? And then a little, I don't really do tactical awareness because why well, do you, I'll, you'll, you'll find out in the, in the next category, but it's how you, how you process the ball. So for me, processing the ball is just, I'm receiving information and based on my information, am I able to have an impact in the game? So it's impact. So some people may not have the technical ability and they're super raw, but they're fast and they find a way to make the most of that element. And so they can have a positive impact in the game. So, so, but if you process the ball and you take a look and if you process more information than someone else, you know where the pressure is, where your teammate is and where the space is, you're going to make a really good decision with that ball and your pass, your technical efficiency is going to help you get there. So that's the third thing. And the fourth thing is, can I get behind the back line? So a goalkeeper wouldn't, a goalkeeper wouldn't have that. A center back might have that on a set piece or two, but everyone else can get that. Outside backs can get behind the back line by making great runs or having great service. Number sixes and number eights can have an impact because they're getting behind the back line by providing scoring opportunities for themselves and others. And for me, beating a back line means they know when it's on and they know when it's not on. So I just put a check mark, whether you either can or you can't. You either are looking to break a team down or you know when it's not on so that you know when it's when it is on. Because if you're just playing the game and really don't know what the purpose is, yeah, you connected all your passes, all your packages were sideways and backwards, blah, 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 blah. And, and man, I completed 500 passes. It was great. It was great. And I said, well, did you create a scoring opportunity for yourself or others? Uh, okay. And so, uh, and then how hard you work defensively doesn't matter. That's back to number one, right? Are you a hard worker, harder worker, or hardest worker? Love it. That's awesome. What, um, so you talked about that. Tell me about um, typical training, your players at, um, at the college level um, that were most successful. And I know that changes. Like, you can't really tell when you recruit a kid at 15 or 16 what their end game at 22, 23 is going to be. Right. But um, in your experience, tell, um, me, tell me some things. What do you define as successful? Hmm. Aren't you smart? <laughs> uh, <laughs> what right. would you think is successful? We've okay. never won the national championship. So talking soccer wise, um, having um, being effective on the field. Okay. Uh, I would say the kids that are that are bought in by meaning like how can I help the team and being vulnerable. I guess being vulnerable to listening and instead of being defensive. And that goes for me too. I'm a much better coach when I'm willing to give a little and figure out what the angle is that they're coming from. Um, but the ones that are like, okay, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to do it. And I think those ones have an easier time at school. And I also think the ones that haven't had an easy go of it up to now um, make, make the biggest stride. And that's where I think is success. So we'll have national team, youth national team kids come on our team. And some of them, how can I help the team? How can I help the team? And they have, they have a great career. Um, or we have some kids that are like, oh, when I come here, it's not as good as a national team. And how can you bring, you know, I'm supposed to bring this national team environment to them versus them bringing their experience to the team and not, you know, so, well, the national team doesn't do that or, the, or my coach told me. So I think the ones that are willing to just listen for the team and be good teammates end up having a, 
a lot of fun because they make better relationships with the coaches and with the teammates. And when you have a lot of fun, when you're a happy soccer player, you're a good soccer player and you're a good student, you're not stressed about school because you're just really loving what you love to do. And, and so even our player, like Lisa, do you remember Cheryl Geese? She's an Eastern Washington kid, Hope Solo's best friend. She's, yeah, so she's in your neck of the woods and, and it was kind of risky for us because we kind of, to be honest, took her because she was Hope Solo's best friend. And we were like, she's gonna help us get Hope. Well, Hope, she's Hope's best friend because she's the best wing woman ever. She's got your back, right? Well, that's how she treated our team. So she, she went from a very raw player who we didn't think was gonna start to a hi to um, <laughs> sorry a little distracted there to a player that ended up starting in our back line um, that was number two in the country and we ended up going to the lead eight and it was because she was that wing woman she she could manage a back line not by her skill set but by her buy in and, and getting everyone else to help her um, and she's one of our most active alumni here's someone that wasn't on a scholarship that we barely we didn't recruit we offered her a walk on spot but because she appreciated the, the environment that she she took it as a as the best thing ever given to her that she wasn't going to blow this opportunity and those people that think I, I have all these resources I'm just going to make the most of it if it's not a good situation I'm going to make it good um, she, like I said she's one of our most active alumni um, ever and you always think it's the ones that were the full ride scholarship kids it's those kids that that feel great because they've they have value to the team and they've improved a lot that's awesome all right so you mentioned hope. Uh, solo. Why don't you talk about um, what it was like to train her um, watching her, you know, from when you started recruiting her as a teenager to um, watching her win um, the 2015 World Cup. Uh, I love training her. My biggest job because she really wanted to be a forward and she really didn't. She knew she was good at in goal, but I don't think she really loved being in goal. I think it was boring for her. Uh, and she didn't understand the position in the way that I think it adds value to a team, I guess. And so my, my biggest thing was teaching her how to love the position. That took two years. So mm -hmm. I remember her junior year saying that she never wanted to step out of goal again. And I put something on her screensaver when she went to her first full national team camp. And that's pretty young to go when you're 17 or when you're 18 or 19. And I just said, you don't, you, you don't have to win the game. You just need to save it right? Because she was trying to do some things that I think she's trying to do too much and it was hurting her and she didn't realize the value in saving the game. Saving the game to me, it sounds incredibly important, right? Like that's yeah. on you, Hope. You need to save the game. If all you do, it sounds boring. If all you do is keep the score the same, you've nailed it, right? Your job is to keep the score the same. And for some reason, she's sent me text after text about how much she's kept that on her screen about how all of a sudden it just kind of put things in perspective. And she's the most competitive. She's the best teammate. I know a lot of you probably won't believe that. Ask the rain players, ask the national team players. Um, she loves people that are critical of her game in the coaching environment. She wants to be better. And if you ever watch any of her, any of her games that were on TV, she's never one of those goalkeepers that's yelling at her bats for letting someone get by. She will give them a smile. She'll go pick the ball up. She'll make a save, go get it for the corner kick or whatever. She'll pick the ball up and she'll look at him and smile and go, you got this. Next one's yours. And um, who wouldn't want to play in front of that? Because they're nervous. They're like, oh my God, I'm playing in front of Hope Solo. I don't want to make a mistake. And she's just like, I, I think she thinks, man, the more you mess up, the more I get to show off. So bring it, okay? bring it. So um, I... I love training her. I pretty much stopped demonstrating when she came onto the team because she's so good. Um, I will always have her back. She, for us, she was a kid that would come in the office and say, oh, I was just wanted to stop in and check in on you guys, but you look busy. Can I pick up your kids from elementary school? So um, that's who she is to our family and still is. She checks in all the time. She comes to all of our alumni games. Um, she's, Three years ago, she said, Amy, I just want to talk to the alums and they're all bringing their kids. Can you please tell them not to bring their kids? It's not that I don't like them, but I'm like, no, no, no. People want to show you their kids. It's a big part of their lives. So I'm not going to not invite alumni's kids. And of course, she tech, now she has twins and they're about a month old. She's like, Amy, forget what I said about the alumni game. I get it. I get it. 
you know. <laughs> so there's a human in there. She's awesome. Um, I've made. I know she's made a couple mistakes. I have too. They're just not in the news. Um, and I think a lot of it is a uh, double standard for sure for things that things that she's done and, and what she's done for U.S. soccer and how she's been treated is um, shameful. Shameful. Agreed. We agree with you. Yeah, it's crazy. Yeah. Um, you know, it's good to have people's back and it's good that, you know, you're able to say that freely that, you know, you think that she got a raw deal because it, we only see the media side of it. Yeah. So. I think that the media is 5% of hope, which is, you know, she doesn't think twice where, and she, and she's way more courageous than I am. So some of the things, you know, some of the, we've all made decisions that we wish we could take back, but I mean, they haven't, everyone should get a second chance, um, especially Hope. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Um, all right, so now get into some good questions. What, um, what aspect of the women's game uh, needs to improve? Pro league exposure, better coaching, uh, grassroots support, all of that, go off on a tangent. I'm like numb to this question. Um, <laughs> I'll, we're, so I'm in a club where they just dropped the, the league. U.S. soccer just dropped the league. So really quickly in two weeks, I've had to manufacture a league, which I don't know is going to happen or not. And my club might be gone as of tomorrow. So, and, and I've been on with all these executive directors, which is why it's so refreshing to see Lisa and to see Amy. And I've just been on these Zooms and you guys have been on it where you see all the pages, right? And you look to see who your peeps are. And I have been on one with 103 people and two women, one of them me. Um, I am losing players right now to clubs that have zero women as head coaches. And they're good, and, and it's never going to change unless we start at the grassroots and then people promote the great coaches to coach better teams. And I, I am embarrassed that I didn't start speaking up. I didn't really realize it because I'm just living in my world. And I, to be honest, have had great women next to me. I've had Leslie Gallimore. I've had Lisa who, like, from the first time I met her, like we just, thank God we were, I don't know if it would have felt differently at regional camp or, you know, coaching in the Pac-10 or whatever without those people. But I think, I didn't realize where I grew up is not like where everyone grew up, where women's soccer players were kind of a thing. Michelle Akers is there, you know, it, it was just a thing. And I'm listening to other people's stories and, and I'm going through coaching school, going through coaching school and playing I'm embarrassed that I felt like I had to be so appreciative of my opportunity. Like, Oh, thank you for letting me in. I know I didn't deserve it, but, and then, that I had to kind of not be me, but kind of be one of the old guys, right. Kind of like I'd swear more every now and then, unless I was around Bruce who treated me like a real human being. Right. Or I, I, I was someone I wasn't just to be accepted. And I did that for years and years and years, instead of saying, wait, that I didn't even realize it wasn't okay. I, so if I would have, I would have hoped I would have said something, but I can't, I mean, it's just been recently. I'm like, what the heck? This is, it's not, not okay. I'm as good as you. Like I need to, you know, Leslie talked to our team at university of Washington. I'm going off now, but we had a, um, we, we sponsor, like we help Austin Everett foundation and Austin Everett was a, is a goalkeeper that passed away with lymphoma and we had a superhero day. So all of these, kids that we've honored that have been really, really, really sick, they came to surprise us our last day and they all had, they all had capes on. And it was a great surprise and they're sicker and have way more serious problems than any soccer problem you could ever imagine. There's no such thing as a soccer emergency. And so Leslie was telling the team, she was like, guys, these guys, and they were all in there with, you know, with prosthetics and with tubes in their bodies and with no hair and with capes on so excited to be with our team because I think that's a cool thing so she was like these guys are superheroes but you guys as a female you need to put on your cape and we had capes for everyone so we went out in our warm-up with capes you as a female you need to throw your shoulders back and you need to put on your cape because you are going to get paid less people are going to make assumptions of you that aren't okay simply because you're a female it's going to be harder for you to get hired 
It's be hard. So when you wake up in the morning, remember that and don't back down. And that's what I think about soccer in the you it's it it is worse than it was when Lisa and I were coaching. There are less opportunities for us. Um, there are less women head coaches in women's soccer percentage wise. And it's because everyone doesn't think that, you know, we have a female athletic director and she's the one that she's the same one that's saying, Oh, you know, do you think you need to, don't you think you need to hire a male just to even things out when we have two women on staff? No, you don't. No. Like in everyone saying when they hired the new coaches, well, you got to have a guy. Are our players going in saying, I think you need to have a guy because there's something of, I, you know, I think there's something because not enough girls have had women role models. They still want to have the, they still want to please a guy. It's just a weird thing. And so we have to fight that. We have to fight that. We, over time, people have learned that we've got their backs and we're as good as any coach out there. But that initial thing of, of that, that piece of, oh, I'll do whatever it takes just to get the, the affirmation. It's just how we've been conditioned. I was the same. I just told you going through coaching school in my twenties, like, Oh, thank you. Thank you for, Oh, he'll pick me for my team. I was better than half of them. Right. Oh, he picked. Thanks. Thanks. You know, thanks. Oh, sorry. My bad. My bad. Sorry. My bad. Just to be accepted. No, like I wasn't doing anything wrong. I should have never said my bad. You know, I should have said, no, you get the ball. You kicked it out of bounds. You bozo. Right. I never did that for decades. And, and, and it's my fault that, you know, not enough of us realize that we're living in this fog of, oh, we're so happy that we're wearing men's jerseys in the 91 World Cup. Like, look at the, our travel gear, <laughs> our travel gear, travel gear is like you go on the plane and you see the guys dressed up with their ties and the blazers and the USR. Our, our travel gear was XL white t-shirts with an Adidas logo and pit stains in them because they were the old men's training gear. Oh my God. You know what we said? This Thanks. is so awesome. Thank you. Do you think Adidas had 24 clean t-shirts? Adidas? They didn't think we were worthy of 24 clean t-shirts going to a World Cup. And we said, thank you. Our fault, right? We said, oh my God, this, look, we got t-shirts. We look the same. Okay. That's awesome. No, that's good. So building off of that, um, what can we as a club um, or me as a coach do to increase the numbers of female players? Starting like little babies all the way through to the professional. If I had the best answer, I'd, or I'd give it to you. But I think, um, I think diversity is an issue too and, and women in the game. And wherever, you, I feel like we say, oh, we have a girls club, we've solved the issue instead of keeping the conversation going or making sure like in our community where we have the places we go are uh, this ice cream shop that no one ever knew was around that's owned by a female. And now everyone knows it because that's our place, right? And we tweet about it and then she tweets us, but now there's a rain, there's a rain flavor, right? And there's a restaurant that's called Odd Fellows that's owned by a female. And we just support those support in, in we buy tickets to rain games and we, even if we don't go, so those types of things. But at the same time, I think, I mean, I feel badly because I don't think our club is very diverse at all. And, and we are in an area where there's a lot of minorities. And I think sometimes, you know, we have, we, we have an African-American on our team and we're like, Oh my gosh, that's so great that August on our team. And like, Oh, we've solved diversity. No, we haven't. That's not, not at what I need to do is f go out and learn about these communities and say, hey, I, I'm not familiar with this community and I don't understand the landscape, can you show me? And I need to go their way. And same with the girls, we need to go their way. We can't expect them to come our way, why would they? They don't feel welcome. So there, if there's any way we can solve these issues by going their way and saying, how can I help? Just like you're doing to me, Amy, just how, how can we help? And, finding a way to get more people involved and then making sure that they feel valued. And, and ev I think that's what sports are for. Everyone, everyone brings value to a team. So if we can be coaches that make assistant coaches that are females feel valued and give them jobs to be and help them be head coaches and, and support them when they're there, they're never going to be ready. Right. And they're until you do the job, no one's ever ready to be a mom until you have a kid. How, how would you be ready? 
that I think we do that and then we're like, oh, we've solved it. We put that female there and then we walk away and no, no support and then they're nervous and then they get lambasted by parents and then someone's like, oh, it's because she's female. She's, we knew it. Oh, she's a mom. She's, got a, she's, got, she's worried about her kids. Oh, she missed a practice. Instead of going, I got you. All the guys too need to go, I got you. How can I help? They need to see you. They need to see you. Um, so I think we need to go, whatever that means when you say go their way, we need to just circle the wagons around the women, guys and girls both, um, because people need to see. I don't want to change the hierarchy. There just shouldn't be one. That's a great point. Yeah, there shouldn't be one. All right. Um, hey, Javi, Walter, we're going to get to some questions now. <laughs> I'm just going to go downstairs. <laughs> 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 okay, this is why it was so fun playing for her, just so so you know. I got four years. Yeah. Okay. Right, here comes some questions. Yeah, here's a question. Sydney, go ahead, ask your question. Hi. I just want to, uh, first of all, say like how I love your passion for the equality aspect. I, too, have, like, I'm, like really, um, like, equality is very important. And a lot of people have, like, in my life have told me that. So I really enjoy that. But I had a question. Who was your inspiration growing up? Um, I, people will say, who was your favorite coach or who? So I was a really shy kid, really shy. And, but I also loved, I was a tomboy. And again, that was a, that was a, oh, she's that tomboy. That wasn't a, a badge of honor at the time. It is kind of now, I think. And so in middle school, I tried out for a volleyball team and the coach just kicked my ass. Like, like nothing I've ever felt before. And I loved it. Like I loved, no one had ever pushed me. I just kind of run around with my brother and so I got the addiction of playing, of being pushed from her. And then my friends, actually, like I didn't have a Megan Rapino to look up to. And you couldn't find soccer on TV unless you really, really tried. And it wasn't anyone, like I watched all the Sounders games when I was a kid. And I, I still have a side ball of them. And so I remember just loving that. But for me... It was people that would stand up for me. Like, so Leslie Gallimore, you know Leslie. She's, she's got a presence. So I, unfortunately, I got behind her for too long. But I never would be there. I didn't have someone to speak for me on, on my behalf. So it was, it's people like Leslie. And, and I mean, you saw the people that we, we invited onto our New Mexico team, right? So Amy is in charge of being on the first ever team at the University of New Mexico. She's one of the first people I called. Because, because I knew, I knew it was going to be shitty, right? Sorry for my bad language. <laughs> there's, we had 17 freshmen on a team out in the middle of nowhere, you know, back then there were hardly any club teams. So I wanted to be with people that I knew would kind of be in it with me and kind of see the fun in, in the bad. Like, like our crew team that won a national championship, they have a, um, Crew is like terrible. You row for days and days and days and days and days and days and days, and you're up at five in the morning, and you your race is like two minutes. <laughs> so, so they have a saying that says, "Enjoy the suck." So Sydney, my inspiration are people that that enjoyed the suck with me, because it because otherwise you just feel like you're in a silo all by yourself. And I feel the same with equality. Now that there's a lot of people with me, I'm way braver, and I think that's probably why. I, I felt like I didn't belong before to say anything is because I didn't have enough people to, to look to. So yeah, there's a lot of people. Every, I've learned something from every single coach and I really can't pick one. Even the ones I didn't see eye to eye with, I had a blast because I, I think I created my own environment and I had, I picked my wing, my wing people. I'd be without, I don't know where I'd be without. <laughs> Olivia. Right. Yeah. Olivia, you uh, would like to ask a question to coach Amy, please. Uh, when you played, how did you control your nerves before a game? I didn't. I just wanted to throw up in my mouth every single time. <laughs> you got, I, um, that's, that's a great question. That's such a great question. 
when I started playing in, at a high level as a goalkeeper, I did sing this song. Come, and it was usually raining, so it's cold, and I'd just say, come on, Ralph, just please blow the whistle. I promise if I get out of this game, I'll never play this position again. I sang that over and over and over again. And then I realized, win or lose, after the game, I realized how much fun it was, that, and that I realized I actually enjoy the adrenaline rush. There are some people that learn how to take their nerves and change it so that they're at that perfect level of excitement, like too much is anxiety and too little is you're not ready for anything and so and i realize i can't control it you i and that i love it like that it is what it is but i think it's easy for me to get in that framework because i i just go for everything right so there's not there's no fault in me making the biggest mistake ever because i'm trying my hardest and i and it's it's not that i just tried my hardest on game day i did it every day at practice so i'm like nothing it is what it is like i'm just trying my hardest so I think when I had the knowledge of that I was in control of that and everything else really didn't matter, it became a lot more fun. But for a while, it was not. For a while, I was, even coaching sometimes, I'm like, what other job gives you this adrenaline rush right before the game? And I have, I have zero control over that, right? Don't tell, don't tell Amy, but coaching's overrated. No, you know, once the game starts, it's your game. So yeah, I think just knowing that there's, all I can do is what I can do. So. I guess that's all there is, right? That's a good question, Olivia. Uh, Naomi, you have a goalkeeper question for Coach Amy. Um, my question is, um, what's a tip you would give a goalkeeper um, while being in quarantine? Um, just move all the furniture out of the way. And... I mean, I would say there's a, there's a lot of fun things that you could do. Um, I learned a lot of great things on my own by, by being the backup keeper in college where I would just be training myself a lot. Um, but I would say if there's anything you can do with a ball, I mean, you want to talk about things to do? Like there are so many things, but if whatever you can do with the ball against the wall, that when you catch it, you have, you're not like not looking at it, but it's just perfect. And you can like bounce it between your legs and catch it behind your back and have it be perfect so that your your focus and your timing and your hands and don't put your gloves on because you're going to develop a really a much stronger pair of hands that feels the ball really well. And you can have people kick balls at you while you're you're say you're on your butt and then you go down to your side, boom, you roll it back. You've done that before. You can do that, right? You go to your left. You can do that. You can actually bounce a ball and close your eyes and the, it'll bounce up and it'll barely touch your fingertips. And then you can suck it up, like, because you just have such a good feel for the ball that you can catch it without even your eyes open. And that will happen in a game. You'll be in a crowd, and you'll say, keeper, and all of a sudden the ball will disappear because people are fighting for it, right? And the ball, will, you'll feel it, and you'll suck it up, and you'll be like, oh, yeah. Yeah, so there's lots of things you can do. And I would say, if you can even Google, you'll, you can Google 101 get great of saves. There's so much stuff you can get on and watch those in slow motion and see why they were great saves. Not just that they were great saves, but what their approach was. So that did they cut off the angle and were they set? If they weren't set, that probably meant they thought they were going to win the ball, at least the 50-50 ball. And so you can, it's a lot easier to learn what, what decisions to make when you're not in the middle of it, trying to make one decision with all the pressure on you. So you can learn a lot by watching, but I would say just get some touches on the ball and do you have a sibling? Um, yeah. Older, younger? Younger. Perfect. Yeah. So, yeah. A lot younger. Just have them, have them kick balls, whatever. It doesn't have to be rifling. Just develop a really good sense of, yeah, have a good feel for the ball. And always try to catch it out here so you can absorb it. Don't catch it in here. Yeah. Don't lean back. All those good things. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Savannah, please, uh, you can ask Coach Amy your question. Okay, so I was wondering what inspired you to pursue your passion in soccer? Like, was it you saw somebody playing and you were like, hey, I want to try that? No, but that's a good question. That I, my brother played soccer, and so my mom signed me up and I, I don't think I even wanted to get out of the car because I was so shy. Um, and I got out and I got to run around and I, I got to get skinned up and sweaty. 
and the people on the team were silly like me and I never looked back and I actually played a lot of other sports but for some reason it was the people that appreciated what I brought to the team more than anything that I mean it was just environment that I loved I for sure am someone that would always be gravitate toward a team sport I think because I like um I like teammates I like having their back and I like I like working hard so that I know that they want to have my back too so I think it was just that first experience happened to be like I think I'm really I think I'm really blessed that um my first experience happened to be with really good people right because who knows, whoever you hang out with decides what kind of decisions you make. And so that's really, really important. So you can end up just taking a bad turn pretty quickly and it's probably who you choose to hang out with. Hi Nick, you wanna come over here and say hi? Come on. Hi Nick. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Dad. This is Nick. Hello. <laughs> All right, Walter, next question. Okay, um, let's see, does anyone else want to ask a question? I know we're running close to top of the hour, but I'll just give a few more folks a uh, question or uh, opportunity to write a question. Amy, I have, a, I have a question for you right now. Can you tell us a little bit about your club? Is it, is it a specific kind of club or is it has a certain focus? Yeah, so our club, we're called the Rain Academy and it's pretty new and it's attached to, it's only four years old. And it's attached to the NWSL team, which was the Rain Academy, now called OL Academy, Academy for Olympic Lyonnais, which is the, we're, we're owned by the team in Lyon, France, which is going to be really nice with, with all the transition and COVID. I don't think our club has felt how nice it's going to be, but when we finally get up and running, um, I think it's going to have a really good feel for um, professionalism. We're an all girls club. Um, 80% of our, well, we have, we have 12 coaches and two are male and they're awesome. Um, our president is female. I'm the director and we, we have all levels. So we have a DA, we're now, we're not, we have a higher level elite league. And we also have a reserve league that plays um, kind of middle of the road. So we kind of cater to, to under nine through under 19 at just about every level, but we only have, we only have 13 teams. So it's not like we're huge. We just, we're just good. And by good, I mean, I don't think you'll find one of our coaches that's a screamer yeller. Um, every now and then we scream and yell, but um, we're one that I think every, every, the, the values kind of align with the OL team, which is everyone has a place. And I think that's why they've had success. Um, yeah, even, I mean, they're the pro team, you should all watch these games when they ever get back on again. But our team had so many injuries that when they took the team photo, there were 32 people because that's how many people had suited up during their season. And you're, they're only supposed to have an 18-person roster with a couple more alternates. And, and they ended up in the semifinals. And this is without, every, like, literally everybody. No one was recognizing half of these people. But it's when the Megan Rapinos of the world, who you, you would think would be like, oh my gosh, we have another college kid on our team or whatever. She'd say, hey, come on in, because she knows how much they need them, right? And the coach, who's Vladko now, so the old ring coach is Vladko, who's the full coach, he was about that as well. So we try to follow their values, and um, it it's, uh, makes it easy to coach, but sometimes the parents get in the way because they want to win all the time and think their daughter's going to help them. Oh yeah, some about that. Yeah. Uh, Mac, Mac Johnson, Mac Johnson, you have a question for Coach Amy. Um, yes, I was just wondering throughout the years, like what was the main struggle for you, like mentally, physically, socially, or etc. All of the above. Um, one was when I didn't know I wasn't going to get a sniff in the World Cup. That was tough. Um, and I didn't really have a long time to figure it out. So I think maybe it was a good thing. I really couldn't stew over it. I was going to miss all the fun I had at the World Cup, right? Um, and, and I really did have to take the attitude of, I'm sitting on the bench. Like, how many people wish they were sitting where I was? You know, a lot of people. So that was one. Um, 
right now I'm struggling. We, we, our club, the U S soccer just ripped the carpet out from club. We used to have this DA status. And so all the families are panicking that our club will look different. We're the same coaches, same team, and we'll have the same experience, but we needed a couple of weeks to figure out if we're going to create a new league or if we're, if we're going to be invited into this other league and all our families just left. And, and we're a good club. And I think they were left because it was fear-based. They didn't, everyone was making them, you know, parents were afraid that one kid was going to get a spot on another club before her kid. <laughs> so it was literally like hunger games. It was just like, everyone is just kind of out for, <laughs> for themselves. And, and I'm, I'm really gutted because our values are, we really care about these kids. And so these kids that I absolutely adore and have been in it with, just kind of left. And I think they left because they were feeling all this pressure. So as a club director, I'm, I'm feeling, cause I think we're going to have to start from square one and I got to put my best face on again and, and, and do that. But, um, that was one. And I, I'm trying to think as a player, I was always on the chopping block for, for the national team. It was a joke. Like pe people would, I would walk around and do this and the, you know, Joy would say, did you feel the ax again? Because people just could not believe a five, four goalkeeper was going to beat out some of these bigger goalkeepers. Um, but I think I, I, I think it makes me kind of who I am. So I didn't appreciate it then. And it goes back to learning how to love the adrenaline, right? And just feeling like the pressure's on me to make, to create something out of nothing. Um, so all those struggles have sort of ended up being the only thing that's I'm proud of that's made me stronger, right? It wasn't, I can't tell you a story about being on a podium that like a save I made that I can't, I'm sure I made some, I, I must've, but I can't, I can't remember a save. I mean, I, and I'm, I'm, I'm really proud of starting a team at university of New Mexico with a lot of young women that, are great young women. Like, I feel like, I feel like I did right by them other than bail on their senior year and head to Seattle. Um, so yeah, I don't know that I'm more about this COVID things way more important than soccer. Like, well, Amy, um, thank you for, um, being authentic and honest and raw. Um, I think that's refreshing. And a lot of times, um, we don't get that from, from coaches um, or people in general. Um, Lisa, do you want to add anything? Nope. It was great, Amy. Thank you. Well, is this, we have to have Amy organize a time for me to actually see you and talk to you. It's so <laughs> Thank you, Amy. That's the best gift ever. Yes. Yeah. Um, so, Javi, do you want to, do you want to close us out? Amy, Absolutely. So, I think we are good. Thank you guys for joining us. And Amy, thank you again for joining us tonight. I uh, hope you guys have yeah. a great evening. Thank, Thank you. you.